Ready when you are. All right. Welcome everybody. My name is Janet Putre. I am the chair of the City of San Diego Commission for Arts and Culture. Thank you for joining us today for our monthly meeting of the commission. I'd like to ask my colleagues on the commission to keep your video on throughout the meeting to remain as accessible as possible to our audience. And I ask the same of participating city staff as well. Thank you. Now we're gonna do a quick roll call to confirm commissioner attendance. When I call your name, please unmute yourself and say present. Commissioner Frank. Unmute yourself and say present. Commissioner Frank. Uh, okay, I'll skip ahead. Uh, Commissioner DeCenzo. Present. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hughes is excused. Commissioner Jackson. Present. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Nuana. Commissioner Friedman, I'm Present. sorry. Present. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Smith. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Schoenbrunn. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Whipper. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Frank. Commissioner Frank, please unmute yourself and stay present. I don't know the rules about this. I know we needed him for quorum. Am I able to go forward, do you think? Um, he is still on, still on, so he must be having just auto audio issues. Maybe. Yes, Jonathan. If he can, uh, can if he can acknowledge in the <clears throat> joining in the chat, we're okay. Okay, great. Vernon, um, could you just type present in the chat, please? If you can hear me. Hmm, sounds like he can't hear us. Not We're texting terrible. him as well. Okay. Just as an FYI, Janet, yes. you don't want to um, notified us that she will be arriving late, but she is attending. I see, great, thank you. Mm -mm -mm. We, uh, Commissioner Frank, can you hear us? Mm. Sorry, everybody. I, we need uh, Commissioner Frank for the full room. Any signs of life over there? We're reaching out. Thanks. Okay, Commissioner Frank is just having some technical issues. So uh, he's here on the line. Uh, if you can call roll, he'll say he's present. I have him on the phone. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Frank? Present. Thank you. All right. Uh, your attendance has been noted. Also joining us today is city staff, including executive director Jonathan Gluss, chief of civic art strategies, Christine Jones, senior public art manager, Chuck Miller, and project manager, Bell Reza. 
Uh, I'd now like to read the Commission for Arts and Culture Statement of Purpose and Vision. Our vision is expanding our world by celebrating creativity in San Diego. Our purpose is the City of San Diego Commission for Arts and Culture serves in an advisory capacity to the Mayor and City Council on promoting, encouraging, and increasing support for the region's artistic and cultural assets, integrating arts and culture into community life, and showcasing San Diego as an international tourist destination. Alrighty, um, before we get into today's agenda, I'm going to ask Bell Reza to run down some of the guidelines for today's meeting. Bell? Thank you, Chair Poutre, and hello, commissioners. Um, we'll do this really quickly in an effort to provide greater accessibility. Members of the public may join the meeting as webinar attendees in order to provide comment in real time. Commissioners, city staff, and authorized presenters are attending the meeting as panelists, and the meeting will function for them identically to a typical Zoom meeting. As a quick refresher, please note the buttons on the control bar at the bottom of your Zoom window. Please try to keep your camera on and your um, microphone on mute when you are not speaking and use the chat to signal when you'd like to speak. Um, thank you, Chair Boutre. All right, thank you, Bill. Um, we're now moved to a non-agenda public comment. The public was invited to submit public comment on agenda and non-agenda items via a web form, which was accessible through the agenda and also through the commission's website. Members of the public may also join the webinar as attendees. If members of the public have submitted comments in, adva in advance in writing via the web form, staff will read aloud public comment. Um, per city public comment protocol. Uh, I'll call on Bell to read aloud any non-agenda public comment or call on any attendees who may wish to provide comment at this time. Bell? Thank you, Chair Boutre. There was nothing uh, written submitted and there are no members of the public in attendance today. All right, very good, thank you. Uh, next up is an action item. Um, and uh, I hope everybody had an <coughs> pardon me, an opportunity to review the minutes from our October commission meeting. Uh, would somebody like to make a motion to approve the minutes? Uh, please type speak in the chat box. I will call on you. Uh, Commissioner Smith? So moved. Thank you. Uh, do we have a second? Commissioner Jackson? A second. Thank you. All right. Uh, before we vote, is there any public comment on this item? No, there is not, but um, just wanted to note that Commissioner Blevins has joined the meeting as well. Oh, great. Thank you. Welcome, Don. Um, okay, uh, so now we'll take a vote on the minutes from the October meeting. Um, remember, you don't have to have been at the meeting in order to vote. I'm going to call your name and uh, you will unmute yourself and say yay, nay, or abstain. All right, Commissioner Frank? Is that through you, Bill? I think we have quorum without him now and I think okay. he's having technical issues. So if we just wanna skip on. on. Okay, very good. Commissioner Blevins? Yay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner DeCenzo? Yay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Jackson? Yay. Thank you. Commissioner Frieden? Yes. Thank Yay. you. Commissioner Smith? Yay. Thank you. Commissioner Schoenbrunn? Yay. Thank you. Commissioner Whipper? Yay. Thank you. And my vote is a yay. Okay. Um, so as you all know, uh, Commissioner Friedman and I have been working with Bell um, on some ongoing um, community engagement activities. Um, you might also know them as field trips uh, for the members of the commission. And so I'm excited to tell you that we'll be touring the Monarch School on Tuesday, uh, November 30th at 4.30 p.m. Uh, you want to make a note of that. Um, we're going to visit the school campus, also their new art center in Barrio Logan. Monarch um, suit serves students uh, K through 12, <clears throat> pardon me, K through 12 uh, across San Diego County who are experiencing homelessness. 
Um, it's not too late to join us. It's going to be, um, I think, a really uh, fulfilling field trip for us. So uh, please reach out to Bell if you'd like to go, okay? Um, I, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm so sorry. Uh, I'd also like to convey my personal gratitude to Ben Meza. You probably noticed he isn't here today. Um, I had to uh, sadly accept his resignation from the commission a couple of weeks ago. He has ongoing professional obligations. And uh, as the way he put it is what I love about Ben. He said, I, I really don't have the time to do the job the way I know it needs to be done and put the time into the commission. And I, I appreciate that about him so much. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, he led the public art uh, committee from the last for the last two years, and he did a super job of that. Um, we had a lot of projects, a lot of um, interesting things going on, even a little bit of a controversy at one point. And he did such a great job leading that committee. Um, so I, I thank him very much for that, and I know we all appreciate that. And I'm personally, I'm fond of Ben, and I appreciate so much his dedication and passion for community and uh, especially San Isidro. Uh, also like to let everybody know that we will soon have a new colleague from District 9, um, Ms. Imani Robinson. She's a resident of Mountain View and she was nominated by council member Elo Rivera uh, and approved this week by city council. So um, I think she will be joining us at the December meeting. So um, that's something for us to look forward to. Um, she's quite an accomplished person. If you have a chance to uh, look into her background, you'll understand why she'll be such a great addition to the team here. So looking forward to that. Okay, um, next up, uh, we have an update on the city's Office of Racial Equity. Um, and that is uh, going to be Jonathan uh, will be introducing us to Kim Desmond. Uh, Kim is our recently appointed Chief of Race and Equity here in the city of San Diego. Jonathan, would you like to um, kick us off on this, please? Delighted to. Thank you, Janet. Um, good morning, commissioners. Great to be here with you today. Um, our relatively new colleague, Kim Desmond, is with us today. I'd like to just say before I turn it over to Kim, um, as you all know, we've been anxiously waiting for um, this first position as um, Chief Rec Racial Equity Officer to be filled. Um, it was a national search. Um, Kim, um, 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 um. What I was told informally is that Kim was head and shoulders above all of their um, candidates um, and Mayor on Down is just um, so enthusiastic for Kim um, moving to San Diego and help us push this um, office forward. Um, I'm not going to read Kim's official bio, but it, um, it's important to say that we lured Kim away from Denver, where she was born and raised, and um, did all of her higher education, which includes multiple degrees. Um, so Kim comes um, with um, a great pedigree to San Diego. And I'm sure, Kim, in part it was because of um, our great weather that brought you to San Diego. With that said, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Tim Get Kim Desmond. Um, yes, yes, partially the weather. There are many other things that brought me here. And thank you to you all, commissioners and guests. Janet, as chair, I want to just acknowledge you for um, putting me in this space. Looking forward to getting to know all of you all and been here a couple months. So definitely still getting myself acquainted to the different parts of the city. So yeah, glad to be here. I am going to actually talk a little bit about some of the approach for the office and then talk about a little bit of what brought me here. And then I'm gonna open up some time to foster opportunities for dialogue with you all. So I know you may have questions for me directly about the office or me individually. 
And I've, I'm on a, a tour right now going to a lot of different boards and commissions. And so definitely I'm building different questions. And this includes also departments and organizations. And so I think this time will be well served if I give you time to just interact and do some Q&A with me if that works. Does that sound good, commissioners? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Is there any way I can share my screen? Thank you. The, the, the COVID is... If COVID is still here, at some point it will not be here. I think we're all hopeful we can get back in a place where we're actually all in person. So by way of, I'll just, before I share my screen, introduction, what's more important for me about this work is my purpose. That's what really leads me to this space. So I've gotten a question around, you know, what brought me to San Diego and what led me to want to do this type of work in local government particularly? I'll say that I've dedicated my, my not only my career, but just even who I am in my own identity in my own life has led me to want to dedicate my time, my talent, my experience, the things that I'm learning to addressing inequity in structures and systems. And so I like to always leave with my purpose in the work because that's the thing that really keeps me going in this space. And so just want to acknowledge that um, first and foremost in terms of who I am and why I came to this city is that you're seeing offices and positions like this pop up across the country. And it's intentionally designed to make sure that we're looking at ways to carve in opportunities to address inequity in government systems and practices and budget decisions. And it, I can just tell you the number has like blown out of the water. So San Diego is not the first. Um, 20 years ago, it was only one city and that was the city of Seattle. Since then, there are over 400. And so there, I, I could tell you, I hear about one probably every week that's popping up. And I do want to just take a quick moment that just, just to acknowledge that today, regardless of um, anyone's perspective or thoughts, because I do recognize in this space with equity and inclusion work, you want to be intentional with the way that you falter diverse perspectives. I do want to take a moment just to acknowledge the verdict that just came down um, this morning around um, Rittenhouse. And so when it's when I just want to acknowledge that, I think I will be, as an equity practitioner, remiss that regardless of your perceptions or thoughts or feelings, it's got to acknowledge where we're at in history and that that most certainly evokes different thoughts and feelings. And so I just want to acknowledge it before I um, keep moving as if today is a, a day as usual. And so it's important for us sometimes to take the time to acknowledge that. So if that's okay with you all. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you for that. That will actually give me this the moment to share my screen with you all to then talk about the, the reason why you know I'm here and why the mayor has um, dedicated to this work. And it wasn't just the mayor. Um, you also had this office is officially added to the um, an ordinance, which means that this, uh, this office, regardless of myself sitting in this position, will remain outside of me. There are appropriate positions in a fund to ensure that we're creating structures to really look at ways to address disparities in all of our city's programs and structures and systems on an ongoing basis. And so me being here most certainly is to partner with the mayor hand in hand around how we do this work. And I wanna always acknowledge the council folks that also had hands in getting this office created by way of budget and added to the ordinance. I always mention um, Councilwoman Montgomery Stepp with her role in that conversation. So I think it's important to name folks who helped bring this work along in the city before I got here. And so this office, most certainly by way of mission, the, 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 the main goal is to ensure that we're being inclusive, not only inclusive, but equitable in the way that we create outcomes, in the way that we dismantle policies that are not equitable, in the way that we look at policies and practices that perpetuate or uphold any inequity and specifically, I do want to call out that it, we have a clear race and equity focus. It's a race and approach for our office, where our office will focus on any disparity that's across um, any layer of diversity. But more poignantly, it's important to point out that there is historic disparities in systems that impact our BIPOC folks. And I do want to acknowledge even the term BIPOC right now in the field is being debated. Terms change uh, it, with, the, with, the, with the wind. And so like, 
whether it's people of color, whether it's BIPOC, whether it's in our city indexes, we call it um, communities of concern. It depends on who you're talking about. So I want to acknowledge that the, the evolution of terms to capture racial ethnic demographics that's connected to the categorization of the census. So I, I just say that in terms of like, I put it in the mission, but I do want to just acknowledge that conversation is a continual one in this space. But more importantly, I want to make sure that we're pointing out, which is in clear for, for our mayor, is that it's about disparities. And we most certainly see that in our city, distinguishing racial inequity or systemic racism, and also talking about disparities that are happening in, for our homeless folks, people who are unhoused. And so that's one thing that me coming here, you see the um, intersection of being unhoused and behavioral health playing out. And I can tell you, it's pick the race ethnicity, it's pervasive in this city. And that's why our office focuses on any disparities because we wanna make sure that everyone as mayor always states, the city is here for all of us. We gotta make sure we're targeted with the way that we solve things, but also universal in the way that we approach the different disparities that we're talking about. So with that, what you get with me is, as I stated, in counting, there are over 400 cities that are doing this work. I've had the honor to build out one of those offices in the city of Denver. And I built that office in partnership with learning from other offices around the country. And so I, one of my main partners was city of Seattle. Um, they were literally on my, on my speed dial because they were the first to do it. And they, the folks in Seattle who built the office, they actually now work for the National Race Ford Office. And there's a government alliance umbrella that overserves and serves all the, the city governments that are now signing up to do this work, all 400. And so the national partners in hub for this work, they have a theory of change. This theory of change is not new for anyone in local government doing racial equity work because it's been tried and true. Number one is to be really clear about how you're going to talk about and address racial disparities. And that's purposeful. And that's a strategy that when, when people hear the word systemic racism, there's some anxiousness that occurs. There's conversations around, do we even talk about it? What is it? How do we define it? What does it mean? What does the equity lens mean? And so when you talk about normalizing, you're normalizing key terms. You're normalizing what is equity. You're normalizing an environment to talk about and decrease anxiety around talking about racism. And so that's a strategy, is to really have an open space to say, we can talk about it. Now that's just talking about it. That occurs in different ways. That occurs in opportunities to train and develop staff around saying, historically, here are some things that have occurred that are very factual based in our country around the ways in which um, systemic racism has impacted um, BIPOC folks. So that's the normalizing conversation. You wanna normalize the conversation and you wanna normalize talking about addressing outcomes. There's not a system in this country where you don't see racial disparities. Education, housing, it is pervasive. That's why these offices exist. It is a systemic driven conversation. And that's why you see offices around the country who are signing up to say, we have to address the disparities that we're seeing. The other part about that is I'm very clear with this work, you can't, out train your way out of systemic racism. And that's not a thing. You can't just train, 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 or pedagogy, learn, 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 and it is done. It's a system, it's a structure. And so training is a strategy, but it's not the thing that's going to um, bring equitable outcomes. There are trainers around the country that's doing this work. So I always like to say, you can't, you cannot train, we cannot train our way out of systemic racism. Or under, underestimate the force of racial inequity and what that means. And so, that is clear that we wanna make sure that you have a multiple prong strategy. So training is one, normalizing. The other part is organizing, creating a culture of inclusion. We have over 11,000 employees in our city system. And we wanna make sure that we're able to address and harness all the capital, including commissioners around the ways in which we organize with address the complex things we're trying to solve for. We wanna be responsive to the way that we engage community members. We want to make sure we're continually um, organizing our learning and our development to make sure folks are understanding the terms, understanding how we're evaluating addressing disparities. Last but not least, we want to operationalize the tools. There are tools in this work that have worked. I've used some of them myself personally. And so I've done things like increased um, rental assistance for BIPOC folks who was underutilizing rental assistance and you did see a difference in government services by race, ethnicity, 
And so I've done this work in very measured ways, using measured tools, which is one of the reasons why Mayor Gloria brought me here, because I have done that. I am not naive, though, to think that, like, in San Diego, it, it's a different context. And so that's why I am taking my time building relationships and learning from you all around the ways in which you see the work so I can keep operationalizing the tools in this work. Um, I was talking to Jonathan about this and that in arts and culture space, racial equity is not a new conversation. It's been a conversation in this space, so it's not a new conversation. You're talking about, like, something that's very visible and tangible to get your hands on. And so I want to acknowledge that this is not a new conversation for arts and culture folks. In many cities, arts and culture um, has always pushed for a rich equity work in the arts and culture. So I just want to make sure I just acknowledge that in terms of the operationalizing piece. But I'm sharing all this to share with you all that I'm using a theory of change that's been used in many cities across the country. And this will be followed with a clear way in which we keep operationalizing these things throughout all our departments. My, one of my sayings that I, I tell folks is when you hear the number 11,000 employees, we have to start with our workforce first. We have to make sure that all of our city employees understand their role in this work and what it means to have a commitment that the mayor is very clear about. And so you've seen the mayor talk about it, this office, um, very publicly. We went on a media tour that felt like 10 years for me. <laughs> um, and in that, one thing that I can say that boldly, we're talking about the way that our investments are made. You may have all recently um, seen the recent recreation report around the historic um, ways in which our recreation programs don't have the same fiscal investments. This is one of the reasons why this office is here. Um, I have folks all the time who maybe want to debate me about systemic racism, and I say, hey, there are clear, there are clear reports that we are sitting on right now that show the investment in programs in our 56 recreation centers and also our investment in parks. And that's why this office is here is to use tools to operationalize looking at our budget decisions to address historic disinvestments in sidewalks and infrastructure. That's a way to quantify the work and that's a classic operationalizing strategy there is to ensure that you're looking at historically disinvested in places. And so, and our mayor is clear about that. He's clear about my charge around the ways in which I will be involved in these spaces. The next piece is, as I'm pivoting on this in terms of I want to pull out some to um, operationalize the work in my particular position, it is to look at the way in which power operates in systems. It's one of my favorite quotes is here on the screen, not going to read it, but it's most certainly looking at the historic uses of power and how power and capital has resulted in historic disinvestment. And so when you have um, a strong mayor of former government, you got to think about how that power is used and how you're looking at ways to address systemic disinvestment. And so these things are important. And Leah, I just want to see you there on the, on the thing. I'm going to say, hey, Leah. <laughs> and so um, these are things that I want to just, I was totally distracted by the Zoom window. And so I just want to just point that out to you all that the policies part is important, the practices and the ways in which we look at our investment is going to be key with this office and how we're doing it. And so in my opinion, historically, there is no one way to do this work. It's up and down, forward and back. There's no blueprint. I could tell you, I've talked to cities across the country with this, and we're all sharing best practices around like, how are you, how are you um, formulating the equity lens? How are you training? How are you using the tools? And with that, we're all being innovative. The county side, they have a new race, racial equity focus as well. So Andrew and I are having the same conversations. And so just know that this is a, this is a, this is a body of work that's not going away. I just, a lot of these offices are now being codified in ordinances and executive orders and policy. So know that this work is, is, is going to be a whole new way of looking at the way you do it in terms of policy and practices. And so that's like the theoretical orientation for the office. And just wanted to end this and open up some time for questions to say that it, it, it's important to know the reasons why we change so we're not um, perpetuating continuous struggle and inequity and that liberation and freedom and equitable access by way of resource is actualized. And so these are things that are important for me. And so I'll stop there because I think that really what's important to me is to have a dialogue with you to see if you have any questions for me about like, and I'm open to any and all questions. I've done this work for a good clip of time. And so would love to hear some of your thoughts or things that are coming in your mind after just seeing some of the theoretical orientation for the way in which the office will be structured and how I'm going to move forward. So 
Jonathan, I'm looking for you. Um, yeah, looking for you around which ways that I should move forward with this conversation. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Jonathan, do you want to kind of uh, moderate this? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Janet. Firstly, thank you, Kim, for that overview. Um, the, the one thing that I would just quickly add to Kim's comments um, is that if you can imagine starting from ground zero inside um, an organization of this size and complexity, um, so many people have been, we have all been waiting for Kim's arrival to um, start the work in this office. We are all in line at her office door, um, virtually and in person. Um, so we're learning among staff that um, there is great intention and commitment um, from the mayor on down. Um, but these are structural changes, so it's also going to take a while. And one thing I'd like to offer, and um, the last thing that I'll offer, uh, is um, Kim has made it really clear that this is also department-based. So even though this is an organizational commitment, because our functions are so different from department to department, um, the way that this manifests itself in each department really will be different. Um, so I look forward to Kim being part of our journey um, as we continue to, to dig into um, um, equity and in particular racial equity and all of our work moving forward. I also want to thank and acknowledge again that Leah Goodwin is with us today, who's been working with us over a, num a number of months um, in this work. With that, um, I think we should just open it to questions or comments. Yes, go ahead, type uh, in chat and I will call on you. Uh, Commissioner Smith. Thank you, Janet. First of all, Kim, just thank you for, for saying yes to San Diego. Um, so I think the first thing I'll say is just, um, Speaking on behalf of just the other fellow commissioners, we love this city, we love this region, ask us for help. And I think my question would be, you are going out to other boards and commissions. I'm a little biased. I'm, I'm such a fan of the work that we do. <laughs> and so my question for you would be, even initially as you're starting to see the landscape of the city, how can we as art commissioners support you? Um, I'll use a super quick example. I also do some work in the um, health and human services space. And there's something about art, again, my fellow commissioners know this, that brings an uplift to the work, right? So I can look at whether it's homelessness or I'll just say homelessness because we're going to the modern art school. But when you put kind of this sense of how the arts can really um, just bring joy and hope, right? We're tackling that issue from a different angle. And that for me is what just brings a lot of momentum and sustainability. So how can we support you, Kim? I thank you for that, for that question. And I will, what you will learn about me and Jonathan probably could call my colleague, um, Tariana, who's his counterpart in Denver. I will take you up on that offer. <laughs> um, I, 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 I know what I don't know, and I'm okay with not knowing what I don't know. And so me being new to the city, I don't know a lot of things. And so, and I'm okay with that. I think we live in a society where you're told that you have to know everything. That's a hierarchical way of living. I don't want to know everything. And so I, I will need you all. I like to think about my, my, th my three and a half months being here. If I could add that to your experience your thoughts, the way you've moved around the different um, districts and neighborhoods as a part of my um, toolbox or sandbox, whichever box you want to play in, <laughs> then that, have, that gives me more information. And so especially as it comes to activating the arts to really talk about a very complex systemic conversation. I think the arts have always been used to do that throughout history. And so I, I, I actually look forward to working with you all around like what ways can we actualize and use the arts as a way to talk about how arts evoke um, thoughts around perception, around meaning that we make in this space, how it captures the moments that we're in right now. So I, I look forward to coming in on these calls and just learning with you all. 
because that is it's so important to me to to, to do that and I, I tell my department staff all the time I say things like I don't know what I don't know and so I'm like it's based to assume that I don't know and instead of not including me in the space include me so that way I can be in the space to say should I be in this space versus saying we won't include you and you make the decision without me so I, I would say when in when in doubt just put me in so we can have the dialogue and I would actually also ask for grace that to dismantle systemic racism is has not been done. And so to Jonathan's point, I'm asking for grace to say, I can't do that in, in, my, in my body, <laughs> right? So just <laughs> grace to know that it's going to take some time to change these things. When you see the report that we had of our recreation centers, that's been decades of disinvestment, decades, decades. That doesn't come because Mayor Gloria said, hire Kim, we're out of a pandemic and the pandemic impact to our budget is real. So just I ask for patience with this administration because he's only been here for going on up to actually almost a year, really. So just be patient. We're looking at decades of inequity that we're trying to chisel in. And so just give us some, some, some hold us accountable, but then some grace as well. So thank you, Rebecca. I will take you up for that feedback to keep jumping in this call. Awesome. I look forward to that. Thank you, Kim. Well, thank you both. That was good. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Doreen, unmute yourself, Doreen. Yes, can, welcome, welcome, welcome. You're so badly needed here. Uh, there's so much mm -hmm. here, and a lot of it, you know, is disguised by happy, you know, handshakes and the, the feeling of uh, acceptance when you're really not accepted at all. Um, I, I'd like to help you. I'd like to serve on your committee. I'm so excited. I work with uh, children. Um, I'm president of the VAP of, uh, Foundation, Visual Performing Arts for Kids. And I see what happens in these schools. And it's all about equity. It's all about every child and every school being represented, having the, 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 the joy of arts, healing, and all that. But uh, we've had to go through a lot of racism. And I would really like to share with you because I believe that racism is at the core of our, our, it starts with our children and how we can have them evolve into enlightened people. Thank, thank you, uh, Doreen. Uh, let's see, uh, Fritz, you had something to add? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, just welcome Kim. Uh, what an impressive uh, resume you have. I did read it. Um, I think it's going to be a very important work, which will try to also infuse some fun with it because I think it's so important uh, to remember the joy of the work that we all do. Um, I am going to be very, I'm going to be very focused, of course, on the general concept of, of equity and diversity and inclusion, but I have a very special focus for obvious reasons in the Asian American community, which I personally always felt had gotten short shrift in many sort of situations, they kind of have forgotten who they were and that they were a very important community. And I'm Filipino American myself, a very important component in the history of this uh, city. And so I look forward to working with you, Kim, and uh, in all aspects of your work, as I'm sure we all do. Uh, and once again, welcome you here. Okay, thanks Fritz. Um, anybody else? I don't see any speaking type. Oh, Dahan. I'm sorry, Dahan. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, welcome, welcome, Kim. I um, look forward to working with you. I'm currently working with Andrew. I've been attending his meetings. Um, I've worked with him for a while before he got the position. I'm a. Uh, uh, before I was a commissioner, I was that person that was chasing the commission, saying, "You got a whole loaf of bread. Why are we only getting crumbs?" So the African American community here is the only community that does not have a district or a designated area that speaks to our destination, our art, our culture. Um, and I dare say it's really difficult to get culture funded in San Diego. For over 25 years, we've um, tried to get people to also notice culture as well as art. And I dare say uh, with you being here and helping that focus be there, maybe we'll get a better understanding and can continue this movement. Because San Diego is beautiful. This is definitely America's favorite city. But as you mentioned before, in, uh, in the fourth district right now, people are in the streets, you know, demonstrating and complaining and wondering 
how something like this could happen in 2021 and what is the future going to look like for us. So while many people are celebrating and happy, there are other people in this city that are feeling it's just a continuation of us being invisible and not having equity. So I look forward to working with you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jahan. Uh, anybody else? I also want to make note uh, I, uh, that Udoka Nwana, Commissioner Nwana has joined us. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. Uh, anybody else have anything for Kim? Well, Kim, I uh, would like to say thank you very much myself. I'm very glad to have you here. Um, and um, I, this is the kind of work that um, I'm really excited that we're getting to be part of. And um, I know arts and culture have a role to play in your work as well. So um, I, I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that you responded so positively to Rebecca's request. So. Please let us know what we can do and how we can be part of your work. And please know you're always invited to our meetings anytime you'd like to come, okay? Um, thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Kim. Uh, and once again, welcome to San Diego. Alrighty, um, next up, we have an action item. And um, I, this is approving our racial equity statement. Um, I wanna begin by thanking Commissioner Nwana and the task force for their work in drafting our first equity statement. Uh, the task force is comprised of Michael Brown, Fritz Friedman, Gina Jackson, and of course, as chair, Udoga Nwana. Um, also like to thank Leah Goodwin, who uh, has been working with us over the last few months, part of our ongoing efforts uh, to collectively learn about and advance our work through the lens of racial equity. Um, so thank you, Leah, and thanks for joining us today. Um, to frame our conversation, please keep in mind that at the June meeting of the Commission for Arts and Culture, I appointed this task force to specifically craft our racial equity statement in tandem to our continued equity training as a committee of the whole. Um, I'd like to quickly remind everybody of our purpose in drafting this statement. Um, on a very practical level, uh, having an approved equity statement uh, is becoming common among national and state level funders, both public and private. Um, and as the long, uh, longtime state and local partner for the California Arts Council, the city applies every two years for funding. We're halfway through our current round of funding, which is about $45,000 a year for programmatic support. When staff preps a new application this coming spring, we must have a statement in place to be eligible to apply for funding. So we anticipate within the year, the NEA will also begin to mandate statement as a part of the application process. Now the commission does not yet mandate um, a equity statement of our um, applicants. And <laughs> We can hardly ask that of somebody when we don't have one ourselves. So um, we pledged to the community, <clears throat> pardon me, 18 months ago that we would do the hard work along with the community. More importantly, it's our ethical commitment at the time of social reckoning and Black Lives Matters protests across the country, we as a commission took a stand against racism and bigotry. Since that time, we've been working as a commission along with staff to identify and eliminate bias in our work. Committing to this statement is the next step. I'd like to invite Commissioner Nwana to brief us on the proposed statement we have today that's recommended for adoption. Um, Udoka, please. Thank you so much, Janet. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Again, apologize for my lateness, teaching a class before this. So thank you, Janet, for that um, lovely introduction and really framing what's going on. So to give you guys a little bit more context, um, the task force met about three times and we started by reviewing a lot of equity and racial equity statements from arts commissions, public agencies, nonprofits and corporations from around the country. And then from there, we turned our focus to our key priorities for our statement. Really, we wanted to focus on something that was short, uh, something that was powerful, uh, impactful, active, and realistic, and um, positive, innovative. And we really, really wanted to include 
transformative action words. And so we wanted this statement to reflect our city, to be, alignment, to be in alignment with the city of San Diego's equity language, as Kim talked about, and also to be something that was useful for both the commission as a body and for our staff. And so finally, we wanted a statement that was simple and succinct. Uh, being a lawyer, I wanted something that you know, really got to the point so that we can hold ourselves accountable to the language that we are committing ourselves to. And so after workshopping some language, we finally landed on a draft that staff tested with our equity officer, as well as communications, COO's office, and the mayor's office. And so speaking on behalf of my colleagues on the task force, we really, truly, truly believe that this statement reflects our objectives. And so we hope everyone finds as much um, you know, pleasure with this statement and really finds it to be true to our values. And so uh, any questions anyone has, be happy to answer as best as I can. And I think you guys have it in front of you. Leave it on the screen now, yes? Great. Um, okay. Um, thanks, Commissioner Nwana. Thank you uh, to the task force for all your work. And um, of course, Leah guiding us through the chat and uh, giving us some examples. Very much appreciated. Um, so what happens next is we're ready for a motion and a second and then discussion. Then we'll vote just like everything else. Um, so uh, would somebody like to uh, make a motion, please type speak in the chat box. To make a motion so we could just, ah, thank you, Commissioner uh, Smith. Um, so moved and also just really wanted to say thank you to Udoka and everyone else who worked on this. Thank you, yes, so moved. Appreciate it. Thank you. Commissioner Friedman. I second. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, now, uh, is there any discussion? You've all had a chance to read this. I. Uh... So um, I think it's great. I do have a question. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, Jan, if I could. How will this uh, statement be now used going forward? Is it automatically put on any of our ancillary marketing material or uh, any documents that we put out there? I'm That's a great curious. question, thank you. Jonathan, perhaps I can ask you to answer that. Sure, um, thank you for the question. Um, it will um, firstly be placed on um, the arts and culture page of the city's website. Mm -hmm. um, and then it will be um, used in our um communications um around fundraising or not fundraising the funding program etc but importantly we have already run this through the city's communications department so they are anticipating this so this will be integrated into city communications as well in some form or fashion um, Commissioner Wilker wanted to add something. Great job, Commissioner Nuana, first and foremost. Um, I just saw one word that I just need clarification on in particular. I know I'm probably the one that screwed this up, but in the second paragraph, the last sentence, it says, ensure inclusive and equitable access. Should that be ensure with an E? as in to make certain as opposed to ensure like with an insurance policy you know i wondered about that too <laughs> that's a mistake right there but i'm sure commissioner noir could explain that one way or the other for me she will ensure that that is thank you thank you commissioner Wilker. yes i will ensure that it is correctly drafted thank you so much thank you i love grammar nerds um Okay, anybody else? I, I, could, could someone explain to me about the racial lens, looking at things through racial lens? What does that mean? Doka, would you like to talk about that? Sure, 
are short on. I mean, it is a term that we do hear thrown around often, but it's actually having that in our mind as we're looking at something. We're not just looking at it like, oh, it's, it's I was gonna say black and white, no pun intended, <laughs> but, but taken into account the racial things that are going on, the systemic racism, the institutionalized racism, all the things that, that weave in the support, the, the patriarchy, I hate to use that, but that we have. And so it's, it's taking all that into account. Um, Dahan, is that what you were thinking it was, or did you think it was something else? I, 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 um, I really didn't know. I really wanted somebody to speak to it because, mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes mm -hmm. we're not that trauma informed. Mm -hmm. So, how are we able to accomplish that if we don't even know? So, I just wanted some clarity on that. By the way, it was, or you know, written. Mm -hmm. But I also would invite um, Kim to step in as well to provide a, a deeper. Yeah, I was, I was being a fly on the wall, but most certainly I can say that is part of this work is being clear about what that means. And there is no, essentially an equity lens, the fancy way to say it is to set a question that you ask yourself to make sure you're interrupting biases, interrupting racial disparities. And so you, it, I think that's a great question that you ask. It's one that the office will be clarifying around when you say equity lens, but I think your, your, your explanation was spot on, where it's like, it, it, we got to think differently about our work. And you think differently by questioning it over and over again. And then you ask yourself how you evaluate it. So a, a real equity lens also have an evaluative component to it to show that you're moving the outcomes. But it, it's something that I will be, perhaps even in a conversation with you all to keep clarifying what that means. Because I, I look forward to even working with you all around, like, let's be clear about what, what is a rich equity lens really means. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Tracy, I'll get back to you, Dahan, in a second. Tracy, yeah. go ahead. Hi. Um, thank you for all the work that you've put into this. Um, my favorite line is actually the um, we envision a city where engagement in the arts and culture is not predetermined by socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, or disability. I think that that like hits home on all, all levels. Um, but my question was, is as Kim mentioned, the term BIPOC is kind of in flux. And I'm wondering if we if we want to use a term that is kind of being like hashed out, discussed, you know, whether or not it's it's truly represented or represent representative, um, if it's encompassing enough, I, I always felt like it wasn't really truly encompassing enough. And um, I always felt like it just wasn't enough. So I don't know if we want to use a specific term that is kind of in flux right now, um, but I'm definitely, you know, I, I think that since it is the term that we're, we are all currently using, it's great, but I, I worry about um, the permanency aspect. Good point. Anybody have something to add about that? And Dahan, you had a, a comment to make there? No, 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 I was just saying thank you because there's a lot of training going on right now in social services and school systems on being trauma informed. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of hard for us if we don't know anything about the different cultures and, you know what I'm saying? How do we look through a lens that's fair and equitable if, you know, we're just some regular people who haven't had all of this cultural, you know, education to make us aware of the people that we're serving and trying to help uplift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if I could say something too related to that, it was, I, I always had a bit of an issue. I just recently learned of that term. I'd never heard of it. But, uh, you know, it, it says to me, um, it's Black, Indigenous people, and then people of color. And I was saying to myself, why in this situation are, is the a, is a Black community primus inter pares, first among equals? Um, where's the Asian thing? and all of that. And where's the Latino thing and all of that? I mean, we're all now lumped into people of color. And so, uh, you know, I'm just saying, uh, you know, I think looking at a term, I think people of color should be the term, period. Uh, of course, the indigenous thing is, and, th and there may be people of color and, un and other underserved communities, because gay people, for example, also have got to be represented. They're not necessarily people. There are people of many colors. So I think BIPOC is kind of vague and not really representative. 
of the totality of the community we're supposed to be serving, my opinion. I thank you for that comment. I'm oh, sorry, Janet. No, I was just gonna call on you. I saw you had your little hand up. So, yeah, this is a dialogue that I was actually having with um, Jonathan about this exact conversation. And I, I feel like for me, and by way of just as a practitioner, it's an opportunity to unpack those things around like, why would the term BIPOC that you pull out black and in, in, in indigenous? So I think first and foremost, it was to talk about the stealing of land that occurred that was first impact indigenous folks in America, right? With that being, and even being in California is boldly, right? And then the black, the black part, the intent for that is to really talk about anti-black sediment and how, and you, I know you all may be familiar with Dr. Ibram Kendi, but he's talking about this a lot right now in terms of the ideology of anti-Blackness and what that means. And so I, 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 I think this term, you may see an evolution in it. So I think what's happening is it's not being unpacked around what the term means around each placement of each word. So i.e., um, I think sometimes we don't talk about the way in which anti-Blackness creates um, dynamics between Black and Latino folks. Black in pick the demographic, right? So I think what's happening is that like anti-blackness is a is, is a sediment that's carried by many different racial ethnic demographics in ideology. So I think to what you're asking, that's it's so important to unpack what that means. And then to what you're talking about around people of color, we there hasn't been enough work done around who's in the people of color, right? And so are you talking about our AIPI folks? So it, it, it's a huge conversation in the field by way of placement in terms and who do you not see. So I've seen folks actually add people of color slash AAPI slash. And so for me, when I see that, I say that the intent for our AIPI folks is in the people of color category and you're calling out anti-Blackness and you're acknowledging stolen land and genocide. It, it's a very complicated way to say it when you're just saying slash BIPOC. So I, those are just my thoughts with it. I think you're gonna. There's no one one way or right way to do it. I think it's really being clear around the education that's taking place with the words. That's one part I was gonna make a comment on. I actually critiqued myself with Jonathan around the last term around we envision a city where engagement in arts and culture is not predetermined by the layers of diversity that you see listed there. What I said to Jonathan and team was that we're talking about systems that impact people. It's not the pe the person's fault. So don't pathologize the person, attack the system. So when you list the people, you pathologize the person. So I think you can wordsmith all those things a lot, but I think it's more than anything. It's just a dialogue that helps you understand like what are we really trying to say here with those terms? This is my thoughts. Thank you, Kim. Um, Jonathan, you had your hand up and I think Don has his hand up too. Uh, thank you, Janet. Just um, a couple of quick comments. Um, one is, uh, I just want to acknowledge that this is um, this and all of our work is going to be living and ongoing. So adopting this statement does not mean that this is sacrosanct and cannot be, or perhaps shouldn't be reviewed um, periodically as our work changes and our community changes. Um, the second thing that I'd like to, uh, just um, put on the table is that a lot of this language is, is actually regional as well. So the kind of, the language we're seeing in statements uh, in the Northeast um, or the Great Red Lakes is really different than the kind of language that we use here just because of the population based and our, um, the history of our systems in these, in these different parts of the country. Um, so I think it's also okay to own language that makes sense in our community that may not make sense in another part of the country. Thank you, um, Dahan and then Tracy. And I, first of all, I just wanted to thank Kim because what, what she said, what she was explaining is what my concern was with the whole lens. We can only articulate, you know, if you never saw a banana before and then somebody asks you what that is, you can't really tell them. You just say it's this yellow thing. If we're not educated, if we're not aware of what's really going on. And it's it, it's interesting to me because you guys know that we're trying to get a, 
a black arts culture district in San Diego. It's never existed before. It's never the funding, you know, we've never been involved in the funding as a black community for since the existence of this. So what I become nervous about is people saying, you know, like all lives matter when people are saying there's disparity against the black community, they don't have an arts culture center, this, that, that, and the other. And then we take this attitude with language that says, well, we're going to cover everybody and not address, you know, the, dis the actual disparity. It's common knowledge that, you know, the things that we're talking about as far as African American disparity and disproportionality, it's common knowledge. So, Hopefully we won't continue that polite conversation saying, well, we're going to look at it, but not, you know, abolish it. It's one thing to dismantle racism, but it's something totally different to abolish it and to be on the same team to do that. Thanks, Dahan. Tracy? Okay, <clears throat> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to apologize for my ignorance, I guess. So are we... Are we all kind of talking about how the term BIPOC is uncomfortable for some of some of us because it does it's not inclusive and that we I mean I, I honestly think that last line in that paragraph is awesome and it encompasses everything and then if we were just to say we acknowledge the need to be intentional and accessible in our work period and then continue on with the conversation that is happening in that paragraph, it would encompass everything that we are trying to do and trying to change and trying to dismantle and encompass. So uh, because I'm kind of, you know, I'm uncomfortable with that terminology, not encompassing everybody. Um, I don't, I don't know if we really need to reiterate that in that particular paragraph. So that's, that's the only and I'm I'm gonna apologize. I'm you know uh, an an educated white person trying to wrap my head around why we're you know calling people out. But anyways, um, yeah, I'm I'm sorry. Maybe somebody can help me understand <laughs> why it's necessary to have that particular term in that one sentence and not be more encompassing. But thanks, hey, Tracy. I just want to ask a quick question for you because this is so important for this conversation. Thank you, Tracy. Go ahead, Kim. Tracy, who do you feel is left out of the term? I mean, you know, the, the Asian, uh, you know, API people, um, you know, and then there's other ethnicities that are uh, not people of color, but are still ethnic. So, you know, like Jew Jewish people or um, there's a lot of, you know, whiter people in all ethnicities, and uh, I'm kind of like, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I don't want to put my foot in my mouth and say something that's going to offend anybody, so I just want to make sure that we're encompassing everyone in other ethnicities and not just, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> Jonathan, you, you've had your hand up. Why don't you uh, go ahead? And then um, I think Dahan had his hand up too, maybe. I just want to uh, acknowledge this is a racial equity statement. It's not an equity statement. Mm, so point. we have a lot of work to do in equity in all levels of our community, economically. Um, a, a lot of what you're talking about, Tracy, the, 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 cultures of all of our races that break down into sub-communities. This is specifically a racial equity statement that calls out our commitment to dismantling systems that have been, dis that have been built to disproportionately um, favor Anglos. That's uncomfortable, but that's the truth of what a racial equity statement is about. Um, so, and it, that is what I wanted to offer. Thank you. It's Jonathan. Uh, Tracy, is your hand still up? Okay. Uh, does anybody else wish to speak before we vote? Oh, I see. Uh, Leah and then uh, Doreen. 
Thank you. I also wanted to just first start with that. Uh, it's been an honor to be on the journey with you all facilitating these very, very um, important yet messy waters. Um, and on two things, on the racial equity lens, in the racial equity toolkit and the research and evaluation work that was done before I arrived, there's very clear language about checking our racial equity lens and asking the questions very much as, as um, Kim had shared, you know, that, you know, why and why and how and going deeper into that because we haven't had that lens. And then um, just to kind of reconnect about the reason for BIPOC and to echo what Jonathan said, this is a racial equity statement. And the truth is that black needs to be first because black people are and have been at the bottom, at the bottom of every single scale of justice. And so this idea about BIPOC, I went through that. I was like, how many different ways am I going to be named? But this using this right now is saying that we are looking at racial equity and we understand, as, as, as Dahana said, the black community is the only community that doesn't have a district in this whole city. We have Chicano Park, we have Little Italy, we have Low Asian District, we have a Jewish community, we have every community. And here we have an amazing history in the black community and, and not a district. So the black is first for those very uh, reasons. And again, I'm honored to be in the room with all of you who are taking this hard work to heart um, at a time uh, such as this. So um, I hope that a little bit for the mail. Thank you, Leah. Your contributions are already great. Thank you. Uh, Doreen, I'm sorry, I want to call you Myron really bad because it says oh, in your name. I don't know why we can't get rid of that. Every, every virtual thing I do, with my, my husband's all about Myron. Um, okay, I, so Myron, you have something to add. Yeah, Myron's in the other room. Uh, I really want to thank Kim and Leah. Um, as a, uh, my husband's an Orthodox Jew, we've faced uh, racism. We've been through, uh, lost many uh, relatives in the camps and through the Holocaust. But I understand that first and foremost, that we have to elevate, acknowledge, and give presence to uh, our Black community. So I'm with you. I understand. I feel it. And I understand the priority. Well said, Doreen. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, I just want to make a quick comment, and I think that it's this is where the conversation around the intersectional component of our identities exists, and even our office focus around like no one should. First and foremost, Black folks can also be Jewish, and so I think anti-Semitism is like <laughs> let's say that let's say that like yes, I, it just it's you should it shouldn't be a thing, right? Any kind of phobia shouldn't be a thing. And I, 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 I think with this conversation, it's met with a learning opportunity to Leah's point around when you pair anti-Semitism with structural racism, you have a conversation of economic exploitation historically for, for a century, over a century. So I think that that's part of like the whole anti-Black conversation is saying, let's talk about that and what that does to all of us around in, in this country. So I think for my office, it's both in. I'm not gonna walk by a white person who is also Jewish, who's also living with a disability and say, oh no, I'm only talking about black folks. I'm gonna say, listen, we shouldn't condone any inequity, but let's be very poignant if we're talking about anti-Semitism that impacts white folks. They can also impact black folks who are also Jewish. These are identities are very interconnected. So I love this conversation. So I think we got to really get to a place where no one's other. I, I just want to say this to you, Kim. We have um, a very, very small uh, population of Ethiopian mm -hmm. uh, Jews in our shul. And they are re more religious than, I mean, they're just wonderful, fabulous people. And we're a family. And I just want you to know it's, it's a wonderful contribution to have that history and, and, and that commingling of uh, ethnicities together. It's quite beautiful. Um, thanks, Doreen. Uh, thanks, Leah and Kim. Um, 
Uh, are we ready to vote yet? I don't see anybody else wishing to speak before we vote. Is there any public comment for this item, Bill? No, there is not. All righty. Um, since uh, it looks like everybody has asked the questions they want to, um, I, we will go ahead and take a vote. Um, I will call your name and you'll respond out loud with yay, nay, or abstain. Um, and uh, here we go. Commissioner Frank? Yay. Thank you. Commissioner Blevins? Yay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner DiCenzo? Yay. Thank you. Commissioner Jackson? Oh, I think she had to leave. Uh, Commissioner Nwana? Yay. Thank you. Commissioner Friedman? Yay. Thank you. Commissioner Smith? Yay. Thank you. Commissioner Schombrun? Yay. Thank you. Uh, and Commissioner Whooper? Yay. Thank you. And my vote is a yay. So motion carries. Thank you, everyone. All righty. Um, next up, we have committee reports. Um, Commissioner Bossler is not with us today for pardon me, policy and funding. And I don't believe they had a meeting this month. Uh, is that right, Bill? That's right. I'm not sure if Christine wants to give the update for policy and funding or if there's anything. Um, I certainly can. Good afternoon, Commissioner. So um, as was just mentioned, the policy and funding committee did not meet in November. Um, they do have a uh, planned um, scheduled meeting in December and at the December meeting they uh, we are anticipating a presentation on the top line results from a recent COVID-19 impact survey of city funded arts and cultural organizations so if you recall there was a first one about a year ago so this will be kind of a benchmark to see any um, type of uh, trends or changes since then so stay tuned on that and we'll be able to brief the full commission as well. And then the Policy and Funding Committee is also anticipating an action item related to the FY23 panelist pool for organizational support program and Creative Community San Diego in preparation for the panel process, which will occur in winter of 2022. All right. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Commissioner Whooper, um, everybody, uh, you might recall, Commissioner Meza is, um, has resigned from the uh, commission. So vice chair of the public art committee is Jason Wooper, and I'm going to ask if he has a report for us. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Coutre. Uh, for the November public art committee meeting, there were no action items. We received and responded to really wonderful presentations on the final six preliminary project ideas for the Park Social Initiative. And we look forward to those projects rolling out in the spring of 2022. Finally, on behalf of the Public Art Committee, I'd like to extend our best wishes to former chair and commissioner Ben Meza. It has been a pleasure to work with him over the past several years and his sage leadership will be missed. Thank you, Jason. Um, I, uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, okay, and uh, Commissioner Hughes is not with us for um, outreach and advocacy and outreach. And I'm not recalling who is on the committee that might give us a report. Jonathan, maybe? Is there a, potentially a report from advocacy and outreach? Thank you, Janet. Advocacy and outreach um, has not met for the last few months. We do anticipate a meeting in January um, where staff will present <clears throat> the findings of our outreach map. Um, and then we'll have a brief presentation of the, the findings of the outreach map at the January meeting of this body. Very good, thank you. Okay, and Commissioner Nuana, um, do you have a further committee report or um, we pretty much covered that with the um, impact statement? Uh, it was covered in the impact statement. Thank you so much for checking. Thank you. All right, is there any public comment for this item? No, there is not. All righty, um, okay. Uh, we're about to move on to director's reports. Uh, Commissioner Schombrin, did you need to? 
I just wanted to suggest that maybe the commission could send Ben Gaza uh, uh, a wonderful thank you note for all of his work. He was terrific, uh, signed by all of us. I think it would be nice. Sounds great. <clears throat> maybe Bell can help us organize something like that. Of course. Thank you so much. Alrighty, next up, uh, director's report. Jonathan, all you. Thank you. First, I want to thank everyone for um, uh, the equity statement. Um, very important to staff um, on personal levels as well as professional levels. So thank you for all of the hard work that isn't always easy. Um, I do want to say again, this is ongoing work for all of us. Um, so we'll continue to work um, with um, Kim's office um, as we move forward and continue to address these issues within our own systems and also in our community. Um, with that said, um, and uh, one final thing about this, it will now, with your approval, it will go up to the mayor's office for dissemination. Um, thank you for the acknowledgement of World Design Capital. It also, almost seems like old news at this point, Rebecca. It's been almost a week, um, but we are delighted that we actually um, <clears throat> received the designation. I do want to share a couple things. Um, first, it, this was not fait accompli. World Design Organization communicated to us that this was a um, this was close. Um, Moscow had a very powerful presentation that really did focus on um, contemporary design as well as just the deep traditions of design in that city. What was so compelling for them um, is the binationalism, but also our willingness to take great risks and um, acknowledge the flaws in our communities and how uh, creativity can really be a tool for solutions and bringing people together. Um, there will not be any additional information um, for the next probably six weeks or so. We're still in final contract, um, not negotiations, but we're, we're winding up the contract with World Design Organization over the next um, two months, I would say. After that, in the new calendar year is when we will start to see things rolling out. So. I can promise you at the January meeting, there will be more information. Um, we're still at the beginning phase of this. Uh, so plenty of opportunities for all of us. I also wanna just say formally in this meeting, when I as a staff person um, am speaking in, within the context of this project and I don't, deliberately refer to the Commission for Arts and Culture. It is not out of disrespect to this body. It's because we have worked so hard to posit our work inside the greater work of City Hall. Um, and we wanna make sure that every department is really participating. Um, so I've been particularly sensitive about that because Rebecca has been so involved in this and I never wanna appear that I'm not um, always recognizing the importance of this body. Call me on it, Rebecca, if I do. No, we don't take any disrespect at all. And as you know, Jonathan, this is heavy lifting for everything. I'm just so happy that you're at the helm for us to really lead all this forward. We don't take any disrespect at this at all. And we still got work to do. So much work. <laughs> um, I have very good news on the staff side. Um, I am going to ask Christina in a minute to talk about some real specifics about the funding program and some of our successes from this fall, but we are close to having um, a full staff back in place. So as you know, uh, Deanna Augustini will be returning 
um, after maternity leave on, I believe it's the 3rd of January. Yes, Christine, 3rd of January. So we almost have Deanna back and we have <clears throat> um, solidified negotiations with a new staff person for the funding program. Uh, we can't quite announce it yet, but I can promise you that we will have a new team member um, in early December. So we're almost back. Um, thank you for being patient with us um, as we have, um, frankly, really struggled this fall to keep processes going, in particular in the funding program. The entire team has been working on this funding program. Um, I don't know if any of the, yeah, Chuck is with us today. Um, in, in addition to absolutely Bell um, taking a lead um, on FY22, FY21 and 22 funding, Chuck and Laura have put public art partially aside um, to keep our um, funding program moving. So um, big team effort, but we're almost at the uh, back at full team. The other thing that I'd like to just say is, um, you know, wonderful news obviously coming from Washington with the infrastructure monies. Um, we will be um, at the table internally to make sure that any opportunities for arts and culture um, are part of the city's applications to Washington for infrastructure money. So rest assured that we're, we're at the table internally uh, and we are certainly watching um, what's happening at the state level as well. So at the bare, bare minimum, hoping that there will be some funds for public art opportunities coming out of all of this. So stay tuned. Um, I believe that's all of my comments right now. I'd like to turn it over to Christine for um, a slightly deeper dive. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. So, um, just as a reminder, the application, so I'm talking about the arts and culture funding. So the application window um, for the fiscal year 2023 cycle for organizational support program and creative community San Diego, um, that closed on October 31st. So staff is now working with the University of San Diego to evaluate um, the submitted responses to the request for qualifications part of the application. Um, and I can tell you that we got the biggest response we ever have in terms of actual submissions. So we had um, 204 applicants submit applications for the FY23. That is the highest, biggest number we have ever had in the arts and culture funding program for those two funding categories. So, um, and of those, of those 204, we've identified 30 that are new to the applicant pool in terms of submitting um, applications. So this is pretty um, extraordinary. Um, when you compare last year, we had 187 applicants at the RFQ stage. So you can see that the trajectory has continued um, an upcline and we'll be able to provide more visualizations and things as we progress in this cycle through the rest of the RFQ phase. We'll be releasing the RFP part um, to eligible applicants um, um, at, in January. And then we'll be able again to visualize more and provide more data as we go along in the process. So pretty exciting um, to, to be able to at least give you those um, cursory data points. And then um, as part of the FY23 process, we did um, anticipate being able to hold nine technical assistance workshops. So we actually did better um, than that. We were able to actually do 12 um, with great assistance from um, Leticia Gomez, who we brought on to help with some of the technical assistance workshops, as well as Bell. We were able to put on 12 workshops um, for organizations. So um, again, um, uh, really a lot of outreach happened. And again, we'll drill down more into that in the coming months. Um, and then another thing as far as the funding program goes, just to remind you, we just have a couple days left for the call for panelists. So um, as you know, we, we've had this uh, call for panelists out for some time looking for individuals um, who can participate um, on the application review um, during the funding cycle phase, which will be in the winter of 2022, typically in March. 
So if you know an artist, a cultural practitioner or somebody in the arts field, um, you know, from any discipline, any type of background, we're looking for people from all over the United States as well as, as, well as Baja California. So if you know anybody, I'll put the link um, in the um, chat in just a minute, but the deadline is a couple days from now. So um, encourage those last minute applications. The form itself doesn't take very long for people to fill out. Um, and then switching to public art for just a moment, we do have a new percent for art project that will be coming online a little bit later this fall. So the city's anticipating being able to release the call for artists for Fire Station 48, Black Mountain Ranch. Um, this is a new fire station that will be built um, and located at Carmel Valley Road and Wine Creek Road, and it really servicing the area in the Black Mountain Ranch community, which is um, in northern northernmost part of the city. And so we're going to be commissioning an artist, like we do, to create a site-specific artwork that will be integrated and um, kind of in parallel with the overall development and construction of the fire station. So we will be bringing um, a PAC recommendation. Uh, PAC will be um, receiving a recommendation and identifying our selection panelists. And so then that PAC recommendation will be brought to the full commission um, at a later meeting. I, I think I'm anticipating that meeting happening in December meeting. So we'll brief you more on this project, but I just wanted you to be aware of that. And then lastly, um, we installation is currently underway for Fallen Fruits Community Fruit Park. And so as you recall, this is the first of three here come the neighborhood San Isidro public art projects. Um, so we're really excited to be able to see this project starting to come to fruition. So we'll be um, being able to celebrate this project along with the other two projects in 2022. So stay tuned for more information as the other projects start to evolve and are, are installed in early 2022 into the spring. So um, lots going on and we'll be able to provide more information and visuals at our upcoming meetings. And that concludes the report for programs. Thank you, Christine. Um, obviously a lot of exciting work. The last thing I'd like to just um, mention is we are um, still deep in the process of install installing SD practice. Um, so a lot of work happening um, around that. We're taking our time to be very thoughtful about placement um, in, um, um, the city administration building that we call CAB. Um, this is the first time that we've intentionally been placing a large number of pieces uh, and that's taking some time to make sure that everyone is on board. Um, so we look forward to having, I don't know, I would say by um, springtime, we'll have the majority of the pieces installed and we'll be very happy to do a walking tour for uh, the commission at that time. Thank you, Janet. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, I must say I'm extremely impressed with the list of accomplishments that your um, skeleton staff is getting done. Um, that's just amazing. And so um, yay for you all. Uh, do we have any public comment on retake? that on the uh, staff report? Do we have any public comment? No, we do not. All right, excellent. Okay, uh, does anybody have uh, some new business they'd like to see on a future agenda? Type speak, please, in the box. I see Fritz typing, speak. Yeah. Yeah, so just curious to know, I think you mentioned, uh, Janet, a meeting or two ago that we have to submit our, uh, the uh, committee members have got to submit uh, their desired commissions that they should be working on or committees they should be working on. Is that so? Um, well, at this point, um, I'm happy to gather that information from you all. Um, I am hoping that we, this is gonna sound funny, but I'm hoping that we will have um, definitive appointment for a chair so that the person who's going to be working with those committees is able to shape them according to how they see the work. So it's a little bit of an awkward spot right now. Um, I'm, under this, I'm under the impression that it'll be resolved in the next couple of months. Yes, Jonathan? 
I've been assured it will be sooner than that, Janet. As long as I find out before everyone else. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and uh, certainly if you want to share uh, your ideas and thoughts and feelings with me, feel free and I'll be sure and pass them on. Um, but I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Thanks so much, Janet. You're welcome. Commissioner Smith? Uh, maybe for an upcoming meeting, Jonathan, possible to get kind of a sense of where we're at with timing and process for cultural plan. Just because Tyler's not here doesn't mean we're <laughs> the issue. Um, so so yeah, so maybe for, for <laughs> upcoming meetings, just really want to make sure that we don't lose sight of that opportunity. Thank you, Rebecca. You know, I'm going to text him and let him know that you did not <laughs> fail to bring it up. Thank you very much. I'm going to write that right now, Tyler. All righty. Um, anything else, anybody? How about any exciting arts and culture experiences you have had this past month? Uh, Tracy? So I don't know if any of you guys have had a chance to go to the Coronado Playhouse and see Tyler in Clue. Um, not yet, but he, not yet, but a couple <laughs> weeks. <laughs> yeah, he is, um, he's fabulous. And um, I think the show is really well done. And um, I immediately texted him when the show was over and said that um, him playing Miss Peacock stole the show. Um, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the actor who played Wadsworth was also really phenomenal as well. So um, if you have a chance to go, it is such a fun performance. And as far as um, you know, cost goes, it's super economical and uh, well worth the trip down to Coronado and into that area. But um, if you if you get a chance before it closes, definitely go see him playing a large, um, excitable and funny woman. <laughs> awesome. Sounds appealing. Thank you. Uh, Dahan, you had something to add? Right. I wanted to say, first of all, big uh, ups to Jonathan, because I think one of the reasons why so many why we have so many extra applications is he literally came to the park in the fourth district in the eight blocks, sat out there <laughs> with all of the different artists who, you know, have been complaining and all these kinds of things. And he literally sat there in a circle and made them not feel invisible each one of them got a chance to like tell their individual stories and you know their frustrations but to have the director literally sitting there on imperial avenue in the park with these artists made i mean they still haven't stopped talking about it it's never ever 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 happened it's not even been thought about people just thought it was impossible and so we, you know, I think one of the reasons why there's so many people who filled out applications, why the numbers are higher, I think he has a large part to do with that. And then the other part is there's some people, they're so traumatized, even with him showing up, they still wouldn't do it because they were like, I just, it's too good to be true. And I think they're tricking us. You know, <laughs> he's not for real <laughs> kind of thing. So I just want to give him really, I mean, that's, unheard of you guys for a uh, uh, director <laughs> to do so on a Saturday. Yeah, unheard of. So I just got to give you big ups for that. Um, thank, you. thank you, Dahan. And that's so true, Jonathan. You really uh, make it work. You get out on the street and make it work. Yeah. <laughs> yep, great. If I could, Janet, if you thank you, Dahan, for saying that. Um, I really believe in public service and we work for the community. So, you know, my, yeah, I'm sorry that it feels like that's important or that's um, something that should be uh, acknowledged. Uh, it's part of our work. Um, and secondly, Dahan, I know better than to say no to you. So when you ask me to be in the park on a Saturday, I'm going to be there. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's a great one. Thank you, guys. Um, I, I want to share a, a cultural experience I had. I um, told my husband, you know, I want to go show you the new Minge. And he's like, as we were walking into the park, he sees the auto museum and begs to go there. And um, I was, I'll admit, not motivated. 
Um, but I have to say, it's a really great little museum. And if you haven't been there, it's fun to check out. And um, it's worth the time if you're on the way to the Mingay, which is also wonderful. Um, so just wanted to uh, give some props to the Auto Museum. We don't often talk about them. Okay, folks, um, let's see. Is there any public comments left? Is there any, oh, I'm sorry. Myron, you have something to add? Yes, Myron, you wanna come in the room and add something? No, I'm just kidding you. Um, can you hear me, Janet? Yes, I can. Okay, so what I wanna share is that I was at the uh, opening of the Museum of Us and uh, the Museum of Us, it, you, uh, uh, was the uh, Museum of Man, as you know, and they had some wonderful, wonderful exhibits up. They have a brewery in there. But what was so special is Larry Baza was um, recognized and honored. He uh, was on their, um, their board. And I had the opportunity to talk to the brother at length and his partner, of course, uh, Tom Noel. And it was very, very touching. And it was nice to catch up and hear, you know, more about Larry, but come visit the Museum of Man. It was, a, uh, or the Museum of Us. It was a nice experience. Well, thanks. Thanks for the recommendation. Alrighty, um, if nobody has anything else, then I will just add um, thank you. Thank you everyone who's been at this meeting today. Thank you all for everything you've done this year. A uh, special thanks to the staff for working so hard um, and making it look easy. Um, and um, I want to say on Thanksgiving, I'll be really grateful for all you volunteers helping my city, yours too, but I appreciate you all very much. So thanks Thank a lot. You. I all have a great and safe holiday and uh, see you all in December. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>